So, hello everybody. Quite a big room. Um, yeah, us, we are Kaja, Kirsten and Jan and uh, all of us, we will introduce ourselves uh, quite quickly at the beginning. Um, uh, I just want to say some few words uh, as the start of. Uh, we are talking about the EU data protection reform. For those who hear for the first time of this, there is a reform going on on the European Union's level uh, on the subject of data protection law. And uh, we are just at the beginning of it, more or less, um, and talking about the possibilities, how to get involved in this, as it was said at the beginning, and uh, what it is, about, it is about, and what are the challenges. And uh, my name is Jan Philipp Albrecht. I'm a member of the European Parliament. The European Parliament is uh, involved in this process and uh, as a member uh, for the uh, Greens EFA group in the European Parliament, I'm uh, working on this reform and I'm also the rapporteur in the European Parliament on this uh, reform, in more particular words, on the data protection uh, regulation, the general data protection regulation of the EU, which is planned. And um, that's all I want to say at the beginning, and I give the words to Kasia. Hi, I'm the difficult name. I'm Katarzyna Szymielewicz, short Kasia. I'm a co-founder and head of Panopticon Foundation, which is a Polish NGO, quite small and quite young, but still quite loud on some issues. In particular, we, we had a fight on internet blocking in Poland, on data retention, on ACTA most recently, and now we are hoping to have a serious fight on data protection. I'm also a vice president of European Digital Rights, for short, Edry. Yeah, hello, my name is Kirsten Fiedler. I'm working as uh, advocacy manager for European Digital Rights in Brussels. And EDRI is a network of 32 civil rights and data protection organizations from 20 European countries. And we work on many issues uh, like um, uh, copyright, data protection, uh, cyber security, uh, data retention, and so on. And our members are, for example, uh, Bits of Freedom in the Netherlands, um, Open Rights Group in the UK, or Panopticon in Poland. And we also have quite a few German members like CCC, uh, Digital Courage, and Digitale Gesellschaft. And yeah, we, we have of course been working on uh, the data protection reform since its beginning because it will have a really strong impact in, in Europe. Oops. So, and this is how we will proceed to present this uh, European data protection reform. Uh, it's the so-called ping pong system. <laughs> So, um, Kaja and Kirsten will do their presentations and uh, after some slides with lining out what the substance is, I will uh, comment or uh, answer on, on these slides uh, to give the ping pong, uh, to, to take the ping pong on and give it back to Kaja and Kirsten. So, the word is back to Kaja. Not yet, not yet. First, uh, we thought about uh, answering the question, why do we need a data protection reform at all? <clears throat> this is an important question, and uh, is it, uh, it is the first que question which, which we need to answer if we talk about this reform. Data protection until today was regulated in uh, different laws in Europe, but also in common European and global laws uh, or frameworks, like, like for example the Council of Europe's uh, recommendations, which is from the 80s, and which is more or less the ground of data protection law in all member states of the Council of Europe. And uh, also it was, based, uh, uh, was the base for the Data Protection Directive of the European Union, which was passed in 1995, 
and which is uh, today uh, a very strict framework for all data protection legislations in the European Union's member states. So the uh, Polish or the Italian or the, uh, the Dutch uh, data protection law is based on this directive of the European Union. And the problem with this directive and with all this law is that it's very different in Europe. So not only the substance is implemented different, but also the enforcement of data protection protection in the different uh, member states of the EU and uh, even more abroad is uh, very different and uh, varies uh, very much. So uh, the question is, could a more harmonized data protection law, so a reformed data protection law, lead to a better enforcement and therefore also to better data protection law in Europe? And of course also since 1995 things happened at least the mass media uh, internet environment came up and also uh, more and more digitalized technologies are leading to a vast amount of processing of personal data today. So the question of how to protect our data uh, in a new environment in the digitalized age is something which we need to answer also. So that's more or less why we need to have it. And at least it's one important point which I want to finish this uh, short uh, explanation with. Data protection is a fundamental right in Europe uh, and uh, in all European member states. So if you have a look into the European Convention on Human Rights, which exists quite long already, then there is a right to privacy and to, to the protection of your family life. And if you have to, a look into the now uh, binding Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, then there is a right to data protection, a fundamental right to data protection. And this need, needed to be implemented implemented now in European law, and that's what we have to do now. Kasia. Okay, that was an MEP talking. Now back to civil society. Our task is to introduce you very briefly to the main issues we see as problematic in the current framework and suggest some solutions that either are already proposed by European Commission in this package that Jan was talking about or that are proposed by us in our amendments. But that all will be explained in a minute. Before I move there, I want to draw your attention to this URL. This is a, a very good resource and everything which we will not talk about today because of very short time, you will find there. It's a lot of policy papers, policy briefs, amendments, basically all the materials prepared by experts that cooperate within European digital rights uh, framework. Uh, okay, so what are the, the main stakes? Uh, we identified six issues uh, that from, in, in our opinion, might be interesting from, from your hackers' perspective and basically from civil society perspective. So very briefly, first, getting the definitions right. Second, getting rid of legitimate interest clause. Third, uh, data portability, we want it. Fourth, a right to be forgotten, to be debated. Fifth, uh, data protection by default and data protection by design. And the sixth, data breach notification. We will go one by one explaining briefly what is it all about and why you should become more interested into these weird concepts. Okay. Uh, as you probably know better than me, every system is as weak as it's weak, as good as its weakest point, right? And in particular, legal system is as weak as uh, the, the the loopholes that are in there. If you think about um, a legal regulation, it all depends on good definitions. If we don't get the definitions right, all the system basically breaks down and uh, stops working properly. And now, in the in the current framework, we see uh, particularly two weak spots that should be amended. One is the definition of uh, data, of, of personal data, so the essential definition. Now it's very contextualized, so the per data can be personal in one context and they are no longer personal in another context, which, which, which brings a lot of fights and a lot of uh, doubts, interpretative doubts that are abused by, by, by companies in particular. And the second issue is the definition of consent. Now the consent in, is also an understood as implied consent. So basically, not even if you give your consent explicitly, but also if your behavior indicates consent, it is treated as consent. Well, in our opinion, both these weak points should be fixed. What we want is we want the same protection for, for data, for personal data, no matter who is processing it, where, in what context, and we want consent 
to be a consent, nothing less than that. So that's the first big problem. The second big problem is what we call, or what the legislators call, legitimate interest clause. Uh, it's essentially uh, uh, one of the legal grounds on which the companies, data processors, can process our data without asking for our consent. So all they need to do is to, uh, is to consider, come to the conclusion that their interests prevail over our interests as data subjects, without consulting us, without announcing this, without making it public. So all the, all the balancing happens in the mind of the data processor, and that's why this legitimate interest clause is extremely powerful tool in processing data. Basically, it's much easier to process data uh, using this clause than any, anything else. That's why we like to see it as a Trojan horse to the whole system. If we keep that clause, no matter how high the protection is in, in other places of the regulation, companies will always be able to get the backdoor entry and take the data for their own purposes by using that clause. That's why we want to get rid of this. And the third thing I want to mention is the data portability. Uh, that's the new concept. Currently, there is nothing like data portability in the legal system. So once you hand over your data to a service provider, you have no right to reclaim it and move it somewhere else. I expect it's not so much your problem, because in this community, I do not expect people to, to use uh, commercial service providers and all the proprietary systems like Facebook or Twitter and the likes. But many people in the world do this. And thinking about so-called average users, we would really like to introduce this right to move your data anytime to any place uh, if you get fed up with your service provider, if you want to use another, maybe better, maybe open source, maybe non-commercial service provider. So it's important thing we are fighting for now. Yeah, um, so uh, the next point is uh, the right to be forgotten. And uh, yeah, this is one of the uh, data subjects rights uh, that the commission proposal, well, the commission pro proposal offered quite a good start with. Uh, Kasia just explained uh, data portability, but another right is the so-called right to be forgotten. And Article 17 introduces this uh, new right. And much has been said about this already, uh, especially in the media. It has been widely discussed and among uh, academia and uh, policymakers. So for millennia, it was very easy for humans to forget and very difficult to remember. But we are more and more uh, moving to a world uh, which builds comprehensive memories. And in this world, uh, power of, over information is becoming everything. So what is this strange new right to be forgotten? Um, first of all, it's not a new right, but uh, simply a repackaging of uh, an already existing right. Um, and uh, this right to be forgotten has two aspects. First of all is uh, the right to erasure, which has already been included in the uh, old directive from 1995. Uh, and uh, this is very important in order to hold controllers accountable and to empower users to take the protection of their personal data into their own hands because supervisory authorities cannot have their eyes on all uh, data controllers all the time. So uh, it is very important to give users strong rights in order to, uh, yeah, for their interactions with uh, data controllers. Uh, the second aspect is quite new. It states that data controllers uh, have to take all reasonable steps to inform third parties uh, whenever a, a user requests them to delete any copies to or links of the personal data in question. So this aspect is meant to contribute uh, to meaningful erasure uh, in the online environment where, well, where it is very easy to republish uh, data uh, yeah, by, by third parties. So in the European Parliament, some MEPs propose amendments uh, that completely remove this right. Um, yeah, to remove the right uh, to have data that are no longer needed uh, to be deleted. And yes, the controller might not need uh, the data in question any longer. And yes, a database is by default a security risk. But, so they argue, um, 
controllers should always be allowed to, uh, to run that risk with your data, just in case the data controller uh, might want to use it one day. And uh, other proposals want to restrict this right to what is uh, practically or technically feasible. And uh, this would uh, lead to uh, controllers that have no longer an incentive to, to uh, have system that would offer this basic uh, functionality. So in a regulation that is aimed at uh, realizing a fundamental right, uh, the company making money out of your data would be able to say, uh, no, sorry, this is too difficult for us, so we won't do it. Um, next point is data protection by design and by default, um, yeah, which is another key concept in the regulation, which is introduced in a separate article 23. And at the core of this approach is the idea to give users greater control over their data, and data minimization also plays a great role here. Um, yeah, data protection by default and by design basically means that we have to think of data protection from the beginning of the development of a, of a product or a service. So do we really need to collect these data, or can we have the same functionality uh, without collecting them? And um, data protection by design means that when uh, designing products and services, data uh, protection requirements should be taken into account from the start. For example, uh, developers of mobile apps, for example. If you take um, yeah, the Angry, uh, free Angry Birds series, for example, it's just a mystery why uh, Angry Birds needs to know my location data. And uh, data protection by default means that out of the box uh, services should be set to the most privacy friendly settings uh, from the beginning. And notably this means that by default personal data is not made available to uh, an indefinite number of people. So um, yeah, these two principles are designed to, to enhance trust in systems and they also help to protect citizens that are not well aware of data protection issues, for example, young users, and ensure that out-of-the-box privacy settings are, uh, settings are chosen from the beginning. And contrary to what industry uh, wants to make us believe, and especially Facebook on this one, uh, sharing does not mean inherently an end to privacy. In fact, with data protection by design and by default, which is good, you can have both. And uh, yeah, the key is for us to be in control of this. Uh, the last key point uh, that we want to talk about today is data breach notification. And um, yeah, the capacity, the capacity of computer systems to store and process personal information has increased immensely in the last uh, several decades. And the amount of personal data that can be held uh, in computer systems has exploded. So we know that 100% system, uh, secure systems do not exist. So mandatory breach notifications are an effective tool to, uh, for to force organizations to quickly and comprehensively address incidents. And incidents can be everything from uh, concerted attacks to uh, just careless handling and disposal of uh, personal data. Uh, just a few days ago, the Belgian NGO NERPA revealed uh, that personal details of more than 1.5 million customers of the Belgian train company SNCB Europe uh, were accessible online. So apparently a user uh, managed to get access to this data database with just a simple search in a search engine. It contained names, uh, dates of birth, uh, email addresses, and in some cases even uh, postal addresses and telephone numbers. And among the information, th there were data of more than 5,000 uh, European Commission officials also, and more than 1,600 uh, European uh, Parliament employees. Um, so, yeah, and even uh, data of some, some activists from our own network. And so far, the chain company did not notify anybody, and it did not make an excuse to anybody 
but just said, okay, we are now looking into maybe taking this person who uh, found this link via a search engine uh, to court. So now articles 31 and 32 of the proposal uh, introduce an obligation to notify uh, personal data breaches within 24 hours. And data breach notification means uh, an obligation for controllers to um, quickly provide information on data breaches, such as unauthorized access uh, or other data leaks. But it is important uh, to note that uh, only breaches that are likely to affect citizens have to be notified to them, not all breaches. And the phrase likely to affect is for us a little bit vague, so uh, we, always, uh, wa we also want to uh, have more detailed criteria on uh, requirements what a data breach is and what a notification should look like. And another useful addition would be um, for supervisory authorities to just establish a register of all data breaches. And uh, yeah, this can help to educate uh, the general public uh, on IT security issues and also to find out some certain trends on data breaches. Yeah, that's Jan's turn. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have heard quite a lot of points what would be necessary for such a reform uh, and uh, what is on the table already since one year now is the uh, commission the eu commission's proposal for such a regulation such a uh, one piece of legislation which gives uh, us the uh, data subjects our individual rights and gives the data controller, so authorities or enterprises, companies and so on, duties uh, when they process our data. This proposal already hits some of the demands which were mentioned, so uh, we have a window of opportunity, uh, I guess, to reach uh, some of those improvements of data protection law on the European level. Um, but we need to assure, first of all, that some of the changes which are not yet in uh, are getting into this proposal, which is already strong and therefore it's uh, quite hard to get more uh, in, so it will be uh, necessary to work on that. But even more important is that this proposal is not weakened down at the end. And what is said by uh, Kaja with the uh, uh, notion of consent and the question of the backdoor of the legitimate interest of uh, the controller, is one of the main battlefields uh, when it comes to heavy lobbying on the European Commission and of course also on the European Parliament. Three of them, of the parliamentarians, are around here with me. And uh, they can tell you there's really hard lobbying from uh, especially huge uh, internet environment companies, especially from non-EU uh, countries, but uh, most of them <coughs> are not lobbying um, for something, they are especially against something, against being regulated. And they are not only lobbying against uh, regulation which is not yet in place, but they are against uh, lobbying against regulation or legislation which is already in place. So they try to water down data protection as we have it today. And of course, they use this opportunity of the grand European data protection reform also for their purposes. Uh, so as we have heard, there are many uh, grounds or reasons for us to fight for a good reform, but there's also a huge risk which uh, we are having in place uh, with this reform. Uh, but as we have uh, at the moment, as I said, a good proposal, or a mostly good proposal by the EU Commissioner for, for Justice and Fundamental Rights. She's a new commissioner, she's quite a strong commissioner in that uh, topic. And we have a European Parliament which has much experience when it comes to data protection, because we have had uh, debates on the so-called SWIFT agreement with disclosure of bank details to the US anti-terror uh, authorities, or we have had long debates on flight passenger data, so passenger rights, uh, passenger name records, and uh, those debates create an environment in which we can achieve a high standard of data protection in, on the European level, but that needs some work. 
Well, okay. Works, works. Uh, I guess the ping pong metaphor is not the best one for our talk because we do agree with Jan on the majority of what he said. And just to let you know, it's a very rare situation that an MEP speaks like he does now. So the main challenge that we see as EDRI is to have an uh, impact on these MEPs who are mostly affected by, by various industries and to create a counterbalance for all the industry lobbying that happens, uh, that happens in Brussels. Um, as you might uh, guess, we normally are on the opposite side. So Jan already said that the industry is working very hard, very hard on a day-to-day -day basis to water down both the existing framework and the new for fr framework which is on the table for, for various reasons which we will not go uh, into right now. Um, so what, what, what we do as, as a community, we try to do exactly the same as industry does. So we analyze the package. It's a couple hundred pages long, so it's a lot of work to analyze it. We try to write the amendments, we write policy briefs, we send a number of emails, we make phone calls, we go to Brussels, we work very hard, so we, we, we try to push this, uh, 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 this in the opposite direction than the industry. Uh, well, but uh, it's easy to guess for you that we are not as strong as our opponent is. So it has to be clearly said today that our position is is weak and it really needs to be strengthened and that's basically why we are talking to you today hoping that we might get some support on this. Uh, so uh, currently what we see is that the majority of the European Parliament is uh, convinced by this commercial interest. The majority is conservative, uh, conservative in, 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 in also in, in terms of uh, business thinking, so they put business first. And what we have already noticed, and it's a very dangerous mind shift that the majority of MEPs is they do not longer perceive data protection as fundamental right. So the basic question that we are asked as citizens when we come to the parliament is, well, why do we need to protect data at all? Right? So they ask us where is the harm? Where is the dead body? Where is the, the problem? Show us. So we are now in the position of people who have to prove their 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 uh, their right to demand data protection. And that's exactly putting the whole system on the head. But that's what already happened under the pressure of industry lobbying. And now Kirsten will give you a few examples of our struggles that we had so far. Yeah, uh, well, as Kasia already said, uh, we, uh, Edri, uh, thank you. Uh, as Kasia already said, uh, Edri is uh, meeting with uh, MEPs and uh, also uh, policy advisors uh, in the European Parliament, and we try to uh, uh, have our amendments tabled, but of course, uh, industry has a lot more financial power and more manpower as well to, to do the same. And uh, yeah, uh, they have already managed to uh, get some MEPs uh, to propose their suggested amendments in the number of uh, opinion committees and well in the European Parliament. And a lot of MEPs are far from being experts on data protection because they just have to cover so many different issues in the European Parliament. So there is a risk of them falling prey to uh, lobby sound bites. And we can give you uh, two concrete examples where this is uh, already happening. It's um, data portability and uh, the, defini the definition of legitimate interest that Kasia already uh, explained. So, um, yeah, one of the new elements of the Commission proposal is the right to data portability, which allows users to pack up their stuff and leave for another service. And there are amendments in the European Parliament uh, that simply want to delete this right completely. Uh, this deletion has been proposed by uh, Mrs. Gallo. Uh, some of you might know her still as the copyright uh, fundamentalist or Taliban, somebody call her, <laughs> uh, from previous dossiers in the European Parliament. Uh, and other amendments restrict uh, it to cases where it is appropriate and forget to define uh, who would determine uh, whether it's appropriate or what appropriate means. Uh, if it's the company who will decide, then you can guess the results. There is also an amendment uh, restricting this right if it could affect uh, trade secrets. 
but uh, I think it's it's pretty much impossible to read the the Commission proposal in a way uh, that means uh, trade secrets. Um, another difficult dialogue, and Kasha already explained this as well, is uh, legitimate interests, which is a Trojan horse in the current current directive already, and in the now in the new regulation, it could lead to all sorts of, of abuses. Um, now, in the European Parliament, uh, there are several uh, amendments to make this concept even more vague. For example, amendments by uh, Mr. Sean Kelly, uh, which is who is the rapporteur in the industry committee for this dossier. So, some people want to open up this provision, saying that controllers uh, should also be able to process data they collected for other reasons and for whatever they think is in their legitimate interest, even if it has nothing to do with the original purpose, or also to allow, it, uh, to allow the, the legitimate interests uh, for third parties. So, um, on the contrary, this should be restricted, if not completely removed. It should at least be explained uh, what interests are seen as legitimate, and which not. After all, the interest of a company is, is to make money, but not everything should be allowed. And there are, of course, many, many good amendments also in the European Parliament uh, that have been tabled. I think there are 753 amendments by now. And um, yeah, but the point remains, there are plenty of, of ways to get this wrong. And if we get this wrong, the price to pay will be very high. If, on the other hand, we get it right and Commission, well, European Parliament and Council uh, adopt this regulation, uh, then we will have a very high standard of data protection, which uh, will last a very long time and which will have also an effect on, on worldwide uh, legislation on privacy and data protection. So, yeah, this is kind of our last chance because uh, we cannot leave this important dossier in the hands of, of some industry lobbyists in, in Brussels. Without a successful reform uh, of the data protection framework, uh, we will be left with a series of legal loopholes and uh, a range of unpredictable enforcement gaps and a race to the bottom where nobody, uh, neither citizens nor businesses, know what law will be, will be enforced, how, when and by whom. So now is our one opportunity to develop a strong legal, legal, strain, uh, legal framework sorry, and to inspire good practice by businesses guided by clear, predictable uh, legal principles and enforcement in an, in, in an environment of trust. And uh, yeah, this is also why we need you guys. It is crucial to provide uh, also technical expertise because this is a piece of legislation which is, which is closely linked to technology. But uh, yeah, most MEPs are not techie people. And uh, so it's, it's very important to provide also accurate information and to explain what the possible risks are and what can be improved. And uh, yeah, Jake Applebaum said this, uh, this morning already, um, it is worth to try to, to, to work on making the world a better place. And uh, the reform of data protection in Europe is now a huge opportunity to do exactly this for the next two coming years. Well, it's an opportunity, but it is a challenge, and we said it many times already that we are losing at this point, and I think, I think that should be made clear uh, uh, now here in this family room, basically. We will never say it in the parliament, because in the parliament we, we keep stressing that as citizens we should be heard, even if there is less of us, even if we, if we have less money, even if we don't go to Brussels every day. We believe we have the right to be heard just by definition, just by the fact of being citizens. But of course you know that it's not always, it does not always work 
work that nicely. So that's the very high time for another grassroots campaign. Well, I know it might sound a bit boring or a bit uh, troubling to say we need you once again, but that's basically how it looks like. Uh, Kirsten underlined that the MEPs, they are not tech savvy. Well, that's a very gentle expression, but it's not, not necessarily a good thing for us. We really need a lot of education for them. We need a lot of work to explain why this is important for us at all. Otherwise, the people from industry who have very easy, accessible, clear language for them on the table, the language of economic crisis, the language of uh, whatever trade secrets, the language of competitiveness, they will always win. So, well, basically we need a campaign, we need you to participate, we need you on the internet mobilizing people and raising awareness about this. I'm sure we will have a workshop or before the end of the Congress to talk in more details about that. So this is basically to show you the problem and to encourage you to get involved. If you do want to get involved, talk to us. There will be our contact details in a minute. Uh, we are here to talk to you, to give you more, more information which cannot be done in that very brief time. And we do hope that there will be at least a small group of people joining us in that fight because it's not going to be easy. Uh, the workshop, I think, is taking place on day three at eight o'clock in the evening uh, in the uh, Quadrature. Two. Day two. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, it's in the program of the workshops anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Before we uh, open up uh, for some questions, um, <clears throat> I would like to say uh, it's really true. These are also um, your contacts uh, to get to know more, of course, about the reform because it's quite a complex issue. It's quite huge. Uh, you have already explained that. Um, but, I mean, there are around one or two hands of MEPs around in the parliament to try to do something. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, beside me, there are also two other colleagues here, Amelia Anderstotter and Marietje Schake. You can talk to them uh, and to me. And um, we all, I mean, we are doing uh, most of our fights together. The last one was about ACTA. And from that fight, we know very much uh, that you need to have uh, public awareness about things going on on the European level, uh, especially in the European Parliament, because it's not natural that we listen to what happens there. Um, but if we have that, if we have some awareness out there, especially with you together, with those you can reach, then there is also the possibility to change something to the good and uh, also um, in the direction of those who feel like being the citizens. And uh, I think that's especially uh, when it comes to the big questions, uh, are we diverting from the concept of data protection as such or not? Are we sticking to the approach that if you want to process personal data, you need to have a justification for that, otherwise you have to do it anonymous. And uh, that we strengthen this approach and that we say there shouldn't be the back doors for different business models or different authorities who think, uh, no, we are so important or our interest is so important that the interest of the fundamental rights should be overridden uh, or of the data subject should be overridden and so on. Those are the big fights we have to take and uh, we are, of course, having an opportunity also for that. That's what I, w what I would like to say at the end uh, of this round, uh, in about two weeks, um, there will be the next step because there will be uh, a report online, which uh, mainly me and my uh, office have has written. And uh, as I have said, um, I'm the rapporteur of the European Parliament for this uh, regulation, which means I'm somehow the chief negotiator. I have to write down, first of all, a proposal for the European Parliament standpoint on that issue. Of course, after the standpoint is open to the public, so in two weeks, there will be many lobbyists outside, uh, first of all, talking bad about this proposal and about me and my colleagues, uh, but also uh, who will then go to the members of the European Parliament, which you have seen also some quotes of, uh, in the industry committee, in the legal affairs committee, or in my committee, the civil liberties uh, committee, and we'll try to convince them that this proposal has to be changed dramatically into, in, in their favor, into their direction. 
And so it would be very important that they are not the only voices talking to those uh, parliament members and also talking in the public and uh, to the politicians, uh, politicians, of course, also in the national parliament parliaments, which also have their say through the Council of Ministers. And uh, then uh, during spring, we will have this debate on the table. It will be necessary that uh, these voice, voices are heard, uh, are heard. And if we manage to have such a public awareness about different standpoints, also from this community, then we could manage to have a very strong standpoint of the European Parliament in April or May, when the Parliament starts to, to negotiate its position with the Council of Ministers. And you know that in the Council of Ministers, for example, there are sitting mainly Home Affairs, committee, uh, home affairs Ministers, uh, the competent Council of Ministers, and we know of them that they are perhaps not the nicest towards data protection. So it will will be even more necessary that the Parliament's position is a very strong one. Uh, and then hopefully if we manage to have a good data protection reform, we will have it uh, before the ne next European Parliament's elections, which will be in 2014. Uh, because we never know what the next parliament in the European Union will think or how the developments are. Uh, if we get it before the next elections, then this new re reform package, the new law in Europe, a strong one, could be applicable from 2016 on. So it's already looking far in the future what we're doing today. But it's important that we get active already today because this, the decisions are made right now. So we are done quite sooner than we thought, and now we are open for all your questions. <laughs> there is one activist already. <laughs> yes, if you have questions, please uh, go to the room microphones uh, over here and over here. You can also participate from home or any Congress Everywhere location if you join uh, hash 29C3 dash Saal dash one, uh, Hall one, actually, on HackInt, IRC network. So, uh, first question over here. Hi, as I understand, this fighting is much more um, than the thinking of ACTA because it's much more in the basic of the data, yeah and privacy thing. Um, how does uh, the thinking of ACTA um, influence this fight for us, uh, or for you? What, is, what does have changed? Uh, well, he, he, well, of course, it's subjective and very personal opinion what I will say now, because he, we will see, right, to what extent uh, members of European Parliament have been affected by the ACTA. But for us, the ACTA fight was also the fight for, uh, for, for sort of changing the, the, the battlefield for the future fights. We knew that if we win ACTA by big majority, as we did, <laughs> that will mean something positive for the future fights. So we are are hoping, but now is just the hope, that ACTA will help us significantly talk to MEPs about this issue, about data retention, about PNR, about all other issues coming up. Uh, that's our hope, and that's the approach with, with which we come to the Parliament. We say, remember ACTA, you don't want this to repeat, then listen to us. So we get the attention. We get the attention, but there is very few of us, and we literally go there maybe once every month, once every three months, depending on the period, while industry goes there every bloody day and that's the difference so we get the attention and we believe that's the result of ACTA but we have no not enough power not enough manpower today to, to win it okay thank you very much hi um, I've been thinking about the future of data protection law or privacy law quite a lot myself and one big problem I've identified is that the entire concept of privacy law as we know it now is the imbalance between the data controller and the data subject. But that picture stems from the 70s where there was less computing power in Europe than it, uh, is in this room right now. So basically everybody is processing data as well uh, at the same moment as he's a subject of the data. Do you see um, any provisions in, in, in the proposed regulations that kind of tackle that problem that 
a lot of data uh, processing is in entirely private hands just for personal use and in definitely unsafe conditions if I look at the wide field of uh, computers and databases that, that are out there. Well, uh, yeah, thank you for your question. I think uh, we already uh, mentioned uh, during our presentation on the six points some of the uh, issues where uh, uh, this regulation aims at giving users more control over their data and uh, to, to uh, get the balance right. But uh, as we explained also, there are still quite a few uh, loopholes that remain and that we need to fix. But yeah, this whole regulation is basically aimed at what, what you're asking for. Um, I can add, uh, if I can add one thing, um, I'm not sure if I get you right, but I, I guess we, the problem you also see is that the users can do a lot of harm by the way they process data. So okay. talking about that point, we used in the current data protection framework, you have a very broad exemption for, for personal use of data, and that exemption will be hopefully limited. That's also one of the issues we fight for. We want to mention in the regulation, the new one, that if you disclose your data to the whole world, you are not covered by this protection, by, by this exemption. So you are essentially treated as an as a, as, as, as a individual, you are treated on the same grounds as, as Facebook, Twitter, everybody who discloses data to the whole world. That might be one of the responses to, to the problem you see. We, we totally share your, your impression that it shouldn't be like this. Okay, hi. So I have a question about the data erasure. So uh, is there any uh, provision about how the erasure should um, have taken place? So should it be like, I don't know, secure erasure or is any place in, in, the, in the language uh, of the, of the uh, legal acts uh, that say that it should be, how should it be done technically? Yeah, thank you for your question. I, uh, we have a general problem and that's uh, different interpretations often. If I read erasure in a law, then this is erasure. And normally courts, for example, would also read that in, uh, in a law. So judges would say erasure means erasure. It's not restorable, you know, so it's durable erased. And um, the problem is that uh, unless there is no judge who, who is saying that clearly, because there is perhaps no complaint of a data subject or no case, um, controllers are going to not follow this definition. For example, with Facebook, where we have the example of Max, Max Schrems showing clearly that he has asked for erasure and the, his data was taken off, but it was still there, so it was not really durable erased. And that's of course an infringement of law. And so what we need to change is not the wording, we need to change the enforcement of this wording. And that's the most important point in this reform. Oh. Hi. Uh, I think your uh, task is noble, but I don't, I'm not sure if uh, only changing the legal framework should do the trick uh, for two reasons. So basically, I think, uh, well, first, uh, the concepts you're talking about really are vague and complex, and I don't think they can be easily defined by a specific legal framework. For example, personal data cannot be personal data cannot be used on, cannot be defined only with a simple universal definition and data portability for example is not generally good or bad sometimes it's good sometimes it's bad i think that legal framework should give some kind of a bit vague definitions and it's about courts who should uh, who should measure when it can be applied and when it cannot be applied. So my question is, uh, what, are, what are European courts doing in cases of data protection and how are you going to influence the courts? Thanks. Well, it's a complex question. I don't know if we have enough time to deal with this, but we can talk later for sure. Um, I would say that's my personal opinion. We haven't agreed on this. Uh, 
I thought the same as you, as, as, as you present, uh, f say, three years ago, but in the meantime, I realized that if we leave it for the courts, we basically leave the industry on the winning side. I mean, citizens will never have enough time and financial power to win cases about interpretation of the clauses. So that's basically why we, st and, and we have seen many cases where citizens were losing or were not even trying to, to, to start the case. And the legitimate interest clause, the Trojan horse we were describing, is a perfect example of this. All of us have our data processed on the base of this clause. And even if we don't agree, how many of us took it to the court? I mean, we see it in every bloody terms and conditions, and we do not challenge this because we have so many other things to do. So our conclusion was that because the clauses are so vague and because citizens have not enough power to fight for this, we really need to make the law more precise. But that, that's, that's one concern. But of course, I agree with you that this is extremely difficult task to get these definitions right. And that's essentially why we invite you to cooperate with us and try to draft them in the language which will include these concerns you, you name. But that's extremely difficult. I'm not able to talk in detail about court cases now because it would really need one hour, but we can maybe talk after, afterwards. Maybe Jan wants to add something. Just uh, shortly, I, I would agree, uh, is, is precise law is uh, mostly or mainly in favor of the citizens who need legal certainty about their fundamental rights position. Normally, if there is unclarity, for example, with other fundamental rights, freedom of expression or information or access to documentation, then courts are anyway doing the gray zone, you know? So having it as precise as possible is, I think, the aim and the lobbyists see that, they try to have it as imprecise as possible because then they or their lawyers can interpret it in their way. Okay. Um, hi friends. Um, first of all, thank you for your hard and essential work. Uh, I have um, a quick comment and a trick question. Um, the, the quick comment is that, as we all know, it's not sufficient to be right. You have to be right and to be loud about it. So um, as an advice to everybody here who would like to participate, one very important thing to do is to transform this knowledge about the process and the, the, the content into some political messaging. So doing whatever uh, blogging, animation, movie, or images you may think about that would illustrate clearly in very uh, simple real-life scenarios what would be life without data protection is something that everyone can do and that could help tremendously put pressure on, on the politicians and make them understand. Uh, now for the trick question. <laughs> um, we see very often that those companies who uh, store and uh, process data uh, just really don't care about the law because they do some kind of uh, forum shopping, you know, uh, um, um, uh, jurisdiction shopping. Like uh, Facebook goes uh, in Ireland because data protection is a bit weaker there and, and so on. Um, are there provisions or can we think of provisions maybe to add uh, through uh, amendments or in your report, Jan, uh, that would try to solve this apparently unsolvable question of Internet being one big universal jurisdiction and uh, having no borders? I can answer myself <laughs> on changing my report. Very good. Yeah, do it, uh, because it needs to be strengthened. Uh, uh, but um, I think there is uh, one approach by the Commission already to get rid of the forum shopping is to have one single European law. So you cannot just go to Ireland or somewhere else to because you know the Data Protection Commissioner is weakly equipped and there's uh, weak implementation of the law. Now uh, there are more checks and balances and one law. And one possibility to strengthen that also uh, is by having the data protection authorities uh, asked to cooperate and to um, uh, consolidate their interpretation also. So they should sit together in a data protection board, meet together and have one definition so that, not, uh, that I'm not able to say, okay, I'm going to Poland because there's a new data commissioner and he's weaker than the previous one or something like this, or there are weak courts. So we need to have consistency and uh, therefore there is this consistency mechanism. I would appreciate every amendment which would strengthen this consistency approach, because that's the biggest loophole we have until now. Um, I can only add that as Edri, we are trying to fight for, for amendment. It's 
pretty hopeless, but <laughs> we try to, to create a special mechanism for the companies that operate on the whole market. So the companies that are present in every single member state because we think they should be treated uh, equally. So there should be a, a particular competence given to European Data Protection Board. That's a new body being created to, to deal with these companies. Otherwise, we will always have a huge company with the best lawyers in the world and one or three DPAs, as you say, selected on the basis of who is the weakest one. So that's one point. And then another point that might be interesting for you in this context is that uh, current draft has a nice provision saying that the company is regulated by European law not only if it sells services here, but even if it targets you. So it's enough to do the targeting, to do the advertising or the tracking you online to be regulated. Of course, there are many companies that hate this provision. They will do everything to kill it. But we want it to stay there because then even the company that doesn't sell to you but, but, but sends you cookies and other tracing mechanisms is already regulated. And that's an excellent one. We have one more question or another question from our remote audience, uh, from our signal angel. We have also four more minutes for Q&A. Okay, thanks. Um, actually, I have a few questions, but we can mix that with, uh, with the hall. So, uh, first question, does the reform also deal with the export of data into non-European countries, like, for example, the SWIFT agreement or the export of, of flight data? So, do you, do you deal with that somehow, or do you just care about keeping, uh, keeping uh, the data in the EU safe? Uh, there, there is, um, or there has been a previous uh, draft of the position which the Commission then proposed on this regulation, and that was the Article 42 of this previous draft, and it has said quite clearly that such requests of data towards uh, big companies, for example, by authorities of third countries, can only take place if there is a mutual legal assistance agreement covering that between the EU and this third state. And this has been uh, on the pressure of lobbyists, also on home affairs lobbyists, taken out. And uh, we will more or less reintroduce that in our proposal. And it will be key to fight for that if you don't want uh, third state authorities accessing private databases. Um, Three more minutes. Please I'm keep your questions short. Sorry. I'm just adding uh, shortly to the last question. Uh, that particular Article 42 actually has been taken out uh, after some really uh, focused uh, lobbying by uh, the United States and ADRI has leaked a first version uh, of uh, the data protection regulation uh, last year and also we leaked uh, a paper of uh, the United States lobbying papers. And that was very interesting to, to read. You can check that on our website and yeah. Hi, you've mentioned at one of the points that um, it's important to replace this, yeah, this thing of legi legitimate interest by form of consent, but I wonder how that would work out in practice. I mean, it could be hidden as yet another clause in the terms of service, or there could be a kind of pop-up as it's now the case for cookies in the Netherlands, but in either case I would assume that the user still doesn't really agree to it, and in the end doesn't have a choice because he can't use the service if he doesn't give consent to it. So how do you think of this in practice? Well, I mean, we, we hope that uh, consent will not be abused in the way you describe, because we are also fight for consent to be explicit. So we fight with the concept of implicit consent as well. If something is written in the terms and conditions, it's not consent for us. We want it to be clear, so you really have to tick the box or do something explicitly with your, with your, you know, with your finger or whatever to, to give consent. Of course, there are other legal grounds, like, like the law. There are like six grounds for data processing. Not only consent, not only legitimate interest clause. So the companies that have uh, a good reason to process data, they will be able to do this, in particular if the law requires them to do so. But what we fight for is closing this back door and focusing on consent when there is no other ground, for example, no legal ground for this. Time for one more very, very quick question from over here. Okay, very quick question. Uh, data portability, which you brought up, um, for which data is it supposed to be? And if I am allowed to take my data from one provider to another somehow, 
is there going to be a standard defined or something like this? Because otherwise one might have uh, more data than the other one and they can't change it and stuff. Thanks. Yeah, of course, very quickly. Uh, yes, we, we, we only fight for the right, for your right to, to take the data that you, um, you have put in the service, right? So, we, Edry often compares this to the, the sausage machine, that there is meat and there is this sausage machine and there is a sausage. So, we do not fight for the sausage. We discuss some bits of the sausage that might be taken back, but definitely we fight for the meat. So, the meat that you put in the sausage, 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 sausage machine should be reclaimed if you want that. And the standard you mentioned, yes, this is part of the package already. There is this requirement that the data should be given to you in a, in an, uh, in a, in a common, uh, one of the common standards. It's not defined yet, from what I recall, so we also fight for making it defined that it should be uh, one of the open, of course, standards. Okay, uh, here we have to wrap it up. Please give a very warm applause to our speakers. Uh, we'll be here uh, another three days or one day, uh, so you can always ask us questions when you see us running around here. Uh, are, do you yeah, have any and come booth? to the workshop, uh, day two, uh, Quadratity Net, eight o'clock. Thank you.